This edition of Space Time is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash space time. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or your MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com forward slash space time for your free audiobook. This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 11, for broadcast on the 8th of February, 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audioboom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, a new study looking at Earth's core. Fresh research showing meteorites hitting the Earth now are different to those that slammed into the planet millions of years ago. And the first movie showing planets orbiting a distant star system. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists say they may be a step closer to solving one of the mysteries of the Earth's core. Researchers are fairly certain that about 85% of the Earth's core is made of iron, while nickel makes up an additional 10%. But mystery still surrounds the composition of the remaining 5%. This remainder is thought to be composed of mainly lighter elements, but their exact composition has so far eluded scientists. Now, a report in the journal Science Advances indicates those remaining elements could be hydrogen, silicon and sulphur. The study's authors from Tohoku University reached their conclusions by developing new models of the Earth's core containing different materials. They then subjected them to temperatures of up to 6,000 degrees Celsius and barometric pressures over 3.6 million times that at sea level in order to simulate the conditions which exist at the centre of the Earth. The researchers then measured the density and sound velocity of their model, finding that the physical properties of the iron alloy containing hydrogen, silicon and sulphur were consistent with seismological observations of the planet's actual core. The Earth's core consists of a liquid outer and solid inner core. The outer core goes from a depth of about 2,900 kilometres down to around 5,100 kilometres deep. The inner core extends from that 5,100 kilometre boundary down to the planet's centre, a depth of 6,400 kilometres from the surface. The core is one of the most important final frontiers for planetary scientists looking to understand the history of the Earth and the conditions during its formation 4.6 billion years ago. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study has found that the composition of meteorites hitting the Earth changed dramatically following a massive asteroid collision 466 million years ago. That cosmic collision changed our solar system forever. The impact smashed an asteroid apart, sending chunks of rocks and debris hurtling across space, some of which slammed into the Earth well before the rise of the dinosaurs. It seems the collision changed the population makeup of the solar system's meteors, polluting the space environment with debris from that cataclysmic event. Now, a new study reported in the journal Nature Astronomy has been looking at the kinds of meteors that were hitting the Earth prior to that impact event. The authors tackled that question by creating the first reconstruction of the distribution of meteorite types before the collision. They discovered that most of the meteorites that are rare today were common before the collision. The study's lead author, Philip Heck, from the Field Museum in Chicago, says the meteorite flux, that is the variety of meteorites falling to Earth, was very different back then compared to what we see today. What it means is that looking at the kinds of meteorites which have fallen to Earth over the last 100 million years or so doesn't really give scientists the full picture. Heck says it's a little bit like looking outside on a snowy winter's day and concluding that every day is snowy, even though it doesn't usually snow in summer. Meteorites are pieces of rock that have fallen to Earth from outer space. They're formed from the debris of collisions between bodies like asteroids, moons and, yeah, even planets. 
These debris particles are called meteoroids. As they fall through the atmosphere, we call them meteors. And then once they hit the ground, that's when they become meteorites. There are many different types of meteorites, each reflecting the different compositions of their parent bodies. So, by studying different meteorites that have made their way to Earth, scientists can develop a better understanding of how the basic building blocks of the solar system formed and evolved. Prior to this study, scientists knew almost nothing about the meteorite flux to Earth in geological deep time. The conventional view is that the solar system's been fairly stable over the past 500 million years. So because of that, it's quite surprising that the meteorite flux at 467 million years ago was quite different from what it is now. To find out exactly what the meteorite flux was like before the big collision event, Heck and colleagues had to analyse meteorites that fell to Earth over 466 million years ago. Such finds are rare, but the authors were able to examine micrometeorites, tiny specks of space rock less than 2 millimetres in diameter that fell to Earth and which are a little bit more widespread. The authors found samples of rock from an ancient seafloor exposed today in a Russian river valley that contain micrometeorites. They then dissolved the rocks in acid so that only microscopic chromite crystals remained. They specifically looked for chrome spinels, crystals that contain the mineral chromite, which remain unchanged even after hundreds of millions of years. Now, since they're unaltered by time, the authors could use these spinels to see what the original parent body that produced the micrometeorites was made of. A careful analysis of the chemical makeup of the spinels showed that the meteorites and micrometeorites that fell to Earth earlier than 466 million years ago were really quite different from the ones that have fallen to Earth since. In fact, some 34% of the pre-collision meteorites were primitive achondrites, whereas only about 0.45% of meteorites that land on Earth today fit in this class. Other ancient micrometeorites sampled turned out to be relics from the main belt asteroid Vesta, recently visited by NASA's Dawn mission. Except for those which hit the planet, Vesta is usually the brightest asteroid visible from Earth. It underwent its own collision event over a billion years ago. Meteorite delivery from the main asteroid belt to the Earth is a little like observing landslides starting at different times on a mountainside. Today, the rocks reaching the bottom of the mountain may be dominated by a few recent landslides. But going back in time, however, the older landslides could be much more important. And the same is true for asteroid breakup events. Some younger ones dominate the current meteorite flux, while in the past it was older ones which dominated. Heck says knowing more about the different kinds of meteorites which have fallen to Earth over time gives scientists a better understanding of how the main asteroid belt evolved and how different collisions happened. The study's co-author, Berger Schmitz from Sweden's Lund University, says ultimately the team want to study more windows in time, not just the area before and after this collision during the Ordovician period, in order to deepen science's knowledge of how different bodies in the solar system formed and interacted with each other. For the first time, we can reconstruct what type of meteorites that fell on Earth in a very, very distant past. In this particular project that has now been published in, in Nature Astronomy, we have made the first reconstruction of the meteorite flux 470 million years ago. If you ask most astronomers today, they will say that the solar system has probably been very stable over time periods of 500 million years. But our really surprising result is that, that it was completely different meteorites. The, the meteorite flux was dominated by other meteorites than those that are common on Earth today. In our sample, uh, we find and many meteorites that are very rare on Earth today. The rock that we have studied, we, we sampled in, uh, in Russia, east of St. Petersburg, there is a section that has very, very slowly formed sediments from this time period. Then we transported the rocks here to Sweden, and then we dissolved them here in our lab. We have developed a method to dissolve really large chunks of rocks, like one ton, 1,000 kilograms. From like uh, 1,000 kilogram of rock, we can recover like on the order of 100 relict mineral grains from from meteorites that fell on the seafloor in the past. I think it was generally been believed that it would never be possible to reconstruct the meteorite flux on ancient Earth because meteorite falls are so rare, but this method seems to give decent results. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. OK, time to take a quick break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Yeah, there are many times when you can't hold a book, but you can listen to one, such as when you're commuting, when you're at the gym, jogging or walking the dog. And that's when I listen to Audible. It's my audio bookstore. And you know, I love the idea of someone reading to me. And no one offers a greater selection than Audible. In fact, they've got something like 180,000 titles plus to choose from. Audible's great if, like me, you have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. 
Audible means you can learn so much. And right now, Audible has a special deal for space time listeners. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. And they've got so many great books to choose from. All the best sellers, the classic science fiction, science fact, history, biography, whatever, often from the people who actually wrote them. How about Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, narrated by Bruce Springsteen? Or The Life of Keith Richards, narrated by Johnny Depp, Joe Hurley and Keith Richards himself? No matter what your taste, there are over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. That's audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or just click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show. Ever since the discovery of Pegasi 51, the first planet detected beyond our solar system, astronomers have been finding out more and more about these strange alien worlds. Over 3,000 so-called extrasolar or exoplanets have now been discovered. We've found that our solar system may be quite unique in the universe. But the idea of planets orbiting other stars isn't. In fact, it now looks like pretty well every star has planets orbiting it. The study of exoplanetary science has therefore advanced in leaps and bounds. In fact, scientists have now put together a short movie actually showing the planets of one distant star system orbiting their host star. Four planets have been captured orbiting a young star known as HR 8799, which is located some 129 light years away. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley speaking with Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Now, up until now, our discovery of exoplanets has been, I suppose, more mathematical than it has been um, actual observation. But that's changing. It is. And, and it's as the technology improves, Andrew. So you're quite right. Um, the first recorded uh, observation of, a, of an exoplanet was back in 1995 of uh, a planet orbiting a star called 51 Pegasi, which is very famous in the world of planetary astronomy because mm. that was the first time a planet had been detected. And it was detected by looking at the wobble in the movement of the parent star. As a, as a planet goes around the parent star, it pulls the parent star to one side and the other. And we can detect that change in speed. We now know of something like 3,000 planets orbiting other stars, many of which have been discovered by the same method. But some have been discovered by what's called the transit method, where you watch the light of a star dim slightly as a planet passes in front of it. Yep. But all of that, as exactly as you've said, is highly mathematical. It all involves indirect observations. You're inferring the presence of a planet from the observations that you can make. There are just a few cases that have been made in the last eight or nine years where you can actually spot the planet directly. And the problem in doing that is that if you have, a, say, a planet like the Earth going around a star like the Sun, what you've got is this object that's shining by the reflected light of the Sun. Um, it's literally billions of times fainter than the Sun is, probably tens of billions of times fainter. And yet, seen from a distance, it's right next to the mm. parent star. And so that's why it's been so hard to detect planets directly. But with the right kind of equipment, and a planet that's far enough away from its parent star, what you can do is blot out the light of the parent star. You can do it from places where the atmosphere is crystal clear. You couldn't do it from Sydney or Dubbo or yeah, places like yeah. that. Got to be on top of a mountain with total air clarity. You use what's called a coronagraph, which is an instrument that blots out the light of the star itself and lets you look in the outer regions. And a few planets have been detected in doing that. Why is this a new story now? Because for the first time, we've got an absolutely stunning movie that's been made over a period of about seven years of this succession of four planets in orbit around a star with the elegant name of HR 8799. It's a young star. It's only about 10 million years old. So it's a young star. It's got a, a planetary system. These are young planets. Very interesting to see that their orbits are actually quite a lot bigger than the orbits of the planets that we know in the solar system. Mm -hmm. So the nearest one takes about 40 years to go around its parent star. I was going to ask you about that because you said this, this is a seven-year right. um, piece of movie. Yeah. And yet that, that 
planet is only moving what one eighth of the way around that, the. That's correct. That's correct. So that's the inner no, that's one. That's too much. <laughs> I'm just uh, doing the maths. Yeah, but no, you're on the money there. So you know, forty years is its is its orbital period. Mm. But the the furthest one is taking four hundred years to go around its parent yeah. star. So that's comparable with Pluto. What's that? Two hundred and forty-seven, if I remember rightly. Years. I'll take your word for yeah, it. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> we have a planetary system here that's showing us. I mean, part of the reason why we can do this is that the orbital plane, if you like, the plane in which these planets orbit is face on to us. So we see them in their effectively circular paths. As time goes on, and particularly as technology improves, this video will be updated and eventually we'll, you know, 400 years time, we'll see them going all do the way around. Do a full lap. Probably, plus many, many more planets. Yeah. But this is, it's staggering really to see how far this progressed in the only 22 years since the very first one was discovered. Mm. These observations have been made with the Keck uh, Observatory in Hawaii, which is one of the world's biggest mm. uh, telescopes. They have two 10-meter telescopes and can do all kinds of things. Fascinating, yeah. And and look, it's another step forward in, in studying exoplanets and brings us a little closer to analysing them and maybe finding those telltale signs yeah. of vegetation or, right. or, the, or the something markers. else. The biomarkers, exactly. Yeah. Mm. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new satellite designed to study the Earth's Van Allen radiation belts has been launched by the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. The Exploration of Energization and Radiation in Geospace, or ARG, satellite blasted into orbit aboard a newly enhanced version of Japan's Epsilon rocket. The 26-metre-long three-stage Epsilon is based around the solid rocket boosters, up to four of which are usually used on Japan's mainstay H-2A rocket. The Epsilon's designed as a lightweight launch vehicle, capable of placing payloads of up to 1.2 tonnes into LEO or low Earth orbit. While most Japanese space missions are flown from the Tanegashima Space Centre, the Epsilon is launched from Kyushu Island's Yuchinora Space Centre on the southern tip of Japan, which is primarily used for suborbital flights. The mission went according to schedule. Pyrotechnics arming completed. OBC sequence timer starts. Thermal batteries activation. SMSJ Tenka, solid motor side jet ignition. First stage motor ignition and lift off. Jill Space Tansa Yote, Elgo Tansa Yota, Kitsuran Rocket Nidokiwa, Hesei Nijun Hatine, Juni Gatsuka, Hoko, Kitsi, Zero Zero Fun, Zero Zero Dioni, Chinora, Chuku, and Kansoku Chokara, Jagera de Masta. The Epsilon 2 with the ERG on board lifted off exactly at 8 p.m. Japan Standard Time from the Uchinoda Space Center. The Epsilon 2 is now flying over the Pacific Ocean to the east with its initial flight angle of 100 degrees. The Epsilon's first stage undertaking a two-minute burn from liftoff, accelerating the launch vehicle to more than 8,000 kilometers per hour before being jettisoned. The Epsilon 2 is flying properly and the ground stations are tracking the launch vehicle very well. First stage motor burnout. The Ogasawara station has started tracking. Payload fairing jettison. First and second stage is separation. The second stage then ignited and fired for another two minutes. Second stage motor ignition. The second stage motor combustion, attitude control, and flight trajectory are all good. The flight goes very smoothly. Current altitude is about 150 kilometers. Velocity is approximately 2.5 kilometers per second. Second stage motor burnout. The launch vehicle is in cost flight according to the flight schedule. Current altitude is about 210 kilometers and velocity is about 5.5 kilometers per second. Second and third stage is separation. Third stage motor ignition. The 5.5 metre long 350 kilogram EIG probe will study how the radiation belts affect spacecraft equipment, including delicate electronics. It will operate in conjunction with NASA's twin radiation belt solar probes. They were launched in 2012 to study space weather generated by geomagnetic storm activity emanating from the sun, as well as high energy electrons in the radiation belts and how they interact. The ERG probe features nine scientific instruments. These include an extremely high energy electron sensor, high, medium and low energy particle sensors, medium and low energy ion detectors, a magnetic field experiment, a plasma wave experiment, 
and a software wave particle interaction analyzer. ERG has been placed into an elliptical orbit to measure the local space environment downstream from the twin NASA spacecraft, which are orbiting closer to the equator. Once fully checked out and operational, the ERG satellite will be renamed ARAS after a river flowing near the Uchinora Space Center. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.